Coming up next on Making Moves, the coronavirus puts a halt to the Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center grand opening. Want to know how the new center will compare to the old station when it opens? Think first class flight versus coach. It's a date that changed the fortunes of the Mayport Ferry forever, we'll explain. And learn why the artwork selection for the JRTC was so important to so many. I'm Bill Milnes. These stories and more right now on Making Moves. Hello and welcome to Making Moves. I'm Bill Milnes. We begin our show in a rather unusual way by telling you about what we're not going to show you. And that's the grand opening of the new Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center at La Villa. As you might expect, that event, like many others in our city and across the country, have been canceled due to the coronavirus. And due to the very fluid nature of this pandemic and the ever-changing response to it, we encourage you to visit JTA's website, jtafla.com, its Facebook page at JTAFLA, and its Twitter account at JTAFLA. For up-to-the-minute reports, we cannot provide you here on this show. When the new Transportation Center does open, we promise that Making Moves will be there to cover it all for you. So for now, let's get to some other JTA news. While we can't show you a grand opening that never happened, we can show you how the Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center at La Villa will be different from what Jacksonville has been utilizing for years. Building this new transportation center from the ground up gave JTA the opportunity to do things differently than the Rosa Parks Transit Station, which has been Jacksonville's main transit hub since the mid-1990s. But the Rosa Parks Station provided little in the way of passenger amenities. As Making Moose senior correspondent Eugene Lindsay reports, the transition from Rosa to JRTC will be like getting an upgrade from coach to first class. How will I know? It starts here at the ticketing booth. There are four windows, two set Laura to the ground for disabled customers and two others for able-bodied passengers. After purchasing your ticket or getting your questions answered, you can go directly to your bus bay or have a seat in the indoor climate-controlled waiting area. Here you'll find restrooms, water fountains with a bottle refilling station, and vending machines to grab a snack or beverage while you wait. This is also where you will find the La Villa room, which can be used to hold community meetings. And here in the indoor passenger waiting area, large video monitors like this one will provide real-time bus arrival information and will direct you to the correct bus bay for your trip. This terminal is a far cry from the old Rosa Parks transit station. First of all, don't be surprised when you see buses driving under the building. It was designed that way. Here at the JRTC, you will never have to cross a bus lane to get to your bus. All passengers will stay on the center concourse while the buses loop around to various bus bays for departure. While it may be a slightly longer walk for some, it will definitely be safer for all customers. There are 21 bus bays in all. Services like Connection or any of the four regional express select vehicles all have designated drop-off locations at the JRTC. There is plenty of signage to help you navigate the terminal until you become more familiar with the facility. You will also find large monitors overhead with schedules, bus bay identifiers, and other critical information. If you're not sure, just ask. There will be plenty of help nearby. The JRTC will also have Wi-Fi available both inside the building and out. Then there's the Skyway. In fact, this location was the home of the Convention Center Skyway Station since it opened in 1989. And it is still here. Well, sort of. Now it's the new La Villa Station and you'll find it on the second floor of the adjacent JTA Administrative Headquarters building. 
One side will run the Skyway trains. The other will eventually be converted for the U2C vehicles. This is the first time the Skyway will have all stations opened in more than two years. Whether you're riding the Skyway, the First Coast Flyer, one of the regional shuttles, or any number of other services the JTA offers, you'll be thrilled to try them from the new Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center at La Villa. At the JRTC, Eugene Lindsay, JTA, making moves. Once the new Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center is open and functioning as the main transit hub for the city, many of you are wondering what will happen to the Rosa Park Station that has served as Jacksonville's main transit hub for the past 26 years. Well, the Rosa Park Station will continue to operate, albeit in a reduced role. Four routes will continue to run from Rosa, including the First Coast Flyer Red Line. The other routes are the 10 to Atlantic Boulevard, the 19 to Arlington, and the 86 to the north side. The Skyway will also continue to operate from there. The Rosa Park Station opened as the FCCJ station back in December of 1993. It was dedicated to the civil rights icon in a special ceremony in 2006. Recently, JTA officials rededicated the station to Rosa Parks, replacing the plaque honoring her that was removed during the installation of new escalators. This terminal opened up in 1993 as the FCCJ station and later was renamed to become the Rosa Parks Transit Station after the civil rights hero, Rosa Parks. We did so because of the courage that she displayed back in 1955, December 1st, 1955 specifically. On that day, she refused to give up her seat at the front of a Montgomery public transit bus. The Rosa Parks Transit Station is located between FSCJ's downtown campus and the First Baptist Church. We have a lot more to come in this edition of Making Moves, including JTA's plans to extend the Skyway to a hot new area of town. How JTA's decision to build in La Villa is already paying dividends. Then later we go inside the JRTC to check out the historic artwork that adorns the walls and learn the backstory on why it was chosen. We'll be right back. JTA has a great new way to get you to the beach. The First Coast Flyer Red Line. JTA's latest bus rapid transit line runs between downtown and Jacksonville Beach. You'll love the comfort of our brand new compressed natural gas buses with free Wi-Fi, in-bus video monitors with real-time news and information, and fewer stops. On weekdays, the flyer runs every 10 minutes during peak hours. JTA's First Coast Flyer Red Line. Make it your new ride to the beach. Because of you, I feel not alone in this world. And you let me know that it only takes one person to make you feel wanted. My graduation was something I will never forget. People like you and me sometimes may have doubts in yourself, but I feel that everything's possible. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. Riding JTA has never been easier than with the My JTA app. Now you can pay for your next bus or ferry ride right from your phone. Just download the free My JTA app from your phone's app store and you're ready to go. Use the drop down menu to select your fare and pay by using Visa, MasterCard, or Discover. You can purchase one, three, seven, or 31 day bus passes or a single ride on the St. John's River Ferry. The My JTA app transit for a modern world. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your favorite brother, your other brother, you, yes. your football buddy, your football buddy, you, the boss, the boss's boss. If one in three adults has pre-diabetes, that means it could be you, your barber, your barber's barber. Nice work. Thanks. Thanks. You, your plumber. Breathe right into your foot. Your plumber's masseuse. Yes. You, your dog walker. On your left. Your cat jogger. Or you, your co-pilot. Your co-pilot's co-pilot. While one in three adults has prediabetes with early diagnosis, prediabetes can be reversed. 
Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org to know where you stand. Welcome back to Making Moves. Some Skyway news now. JTA has announced it plans to open a new Skyway station in the burgeoning Brooklyn neighborhood. The station would be next to the Skyway Operations and Maintenance Center, which sits directly across the street from the Brooklyn Station Shopping Center. There are shops, restaurants, a hotel under construction, and nearly 1,000 residences, either active or in development in Brooklyn, as well as thousands of office workers, all within walking distance of the planned Skyway station. JTA would utilize existing track and two refurbished train cars. The Brooklyn extension would eventually be adapted to support autonomous vehicles as part of JTA's Ultimate Urban Circulator program. JTA has applied for a grant to fund the Brooklyn project. Before two Skyway stations closed for construction, people were taking about 1.3 million trips per year on the elevated train system. Now for the first time in three years, all eight Skyway stations will soon be open. Only now there are three residential housing developments with hundreds of units open near two of those stations. If what happened 18 months ago is any indication, one station in particular, the Jefferson Station, should see a significant jump in ridership. In his report from November 2018, Making Moves senior correspondent Eugene Lindsay shows us how the opening of the first of those developments, the lofts at La Villa, proved the value in combining housing with transit. Historic La Villa is in the midst of a renaissance. New development is happening throughout the area. Multi-level residential communities are being built and they're drawing hundreds of people to move into the urban core. Phase two of the Jacksonville Regional Transportation Center is also located in La Villa and they too are moving full speed ahead with construction. The location and accessibility to public transportation is expected to be a key component in the success of this renaissance boom. It's been very well received. Lofts at La Villa, which is 100% um, affordable. We knew it would lease up. We thought it would lease up quickly, but we didn't realize how fast it would actually lease up. It was 100% occupied within 45 days of opening. Hoover says being able to develop a residential community that flows along the path of mass transit is a benefit to people living here, as well as helping to spawn more growth into downtown Jacksonville. After we saw what was going on in Brooklyn and the excitement and the, all the development there, we kind of saw La Villa as the next step where it kind of bridges between Brooklyn and downtown. Their newest project, the lofts at Jefferson, is currently in the early stages of construction and has the Jefferson Station Skyway stop practically interwoven into its plans. So on the northeastern stairwell, we will have a connection at the bottom of the stairs a sidewalk that goes from the stairwell out the building directly to Jefferson Station, uh, the covered area. So we'll have an easy access into the station. The idea here is to make living in La Villa both appealing and affordable to a cross-section of people of various income levels. They offer two categories of housing. Affordable housing are units set aside for people who make less than 60% of the area median income, which for a single person is about $29,000 a year, and for families of four, around $41,000. Then there's also workforce housing. Now these are homes geared towards singles whose annual income is about $68,000 a year. And for families of four, whose income is around $97,000. I think really to get a downtown, a strong downtown, you have to have everybody uh, be able to live downtown. A lot of people that work down here may not be able to afford some of those rents. So the more you have, the more demand for services there is, whether it's grocery stores, you know, um, pharmacies, anything that you would have downtown. So the more people you get down there, the more demand you'll have for it, which will help other things come in and grow as well. This new development has had an immediate impact on Skyway ridership, specifically at the Jefferson Station. Ridership at Jefferson is up nearly 1,000 riders a month since the lofts at La Villa opened its door. Hoover says some people who have already chosen this new lofty lifestyle are taking full advantage of the convenience of mass transit. We have several residents that use it at lofts at La Villa. Um, we know some that use it every day for work. We know one resident that actually works for the city, uses it every day and it saves her about 50 bucks a month in parking and other um, 
fees. Hoover says the lofts at Jefferson is scheduled to begin housing new tenants by the fall of 2019. In the villa, Eugene Lindsay, JTA, making moves. Now with the pending opening of the new regional transportation center comes the full reopening of all the Skyway platforms. This will put the Skyway at full operational capacity for the first time in three years. Skyway passengers can also expect things to be different. First, the convention center station is no more. In its place is the new La Villa station. This new platform will also have a new look, but the biggest change will likely be the number of people riding the Skyway. Along with the new La Villa station generating passenger trips, so too is the Jefferson station, thanks in large part to two new multi-story residential buildings adjacent to the Skyway. Ridership at Jefferson station is zooming upward. For a station that previously had monthly ridership counted in the hundreds, Jefferson is now averaging around 2,800 trips per month, with peak months pushing 3,500, and is expected to continue to grow upward. A full-strength Skyway system, aided by the growing excitement of the new transit center, plus additional employee ridership, could soon see numbers breaking the 4,000 per month or more barrier. From the Skyway to the ferry now, it's hard to believe that four years ago last week, history was made when the JTA officially took ownership of the St. John's River Ferry, ensuring the vessel's financial stability for the foreseeable future. Since that day, the JTA has invested millions of dollars in both the vessel and ferry infrastructure. And as Making Moves correspondent Karen Adams tells us, not only has everything about the ferry been overhauled, ridership on the ferry has nearly doubled during JTA's ownership. March 2016, the St. John's River Ferry is returned to the water, fresh from a much needed maintenance overhaul. In addition to the upgrades on the boat itself, repairs were also made to the slip walls where the ferry docks to board passengers and vehicles. The ferry is much beloved by the community, but nobody in government seemingly wanted to run the service. That's when the JTA took over. It seemed like a natural fit. After all, for all its pleasure cruise ambience, the ferry was still a transportation vehicle, much like a bus or a train, except this one crosses the river to connect Mayport with Fort George Island. JTA had done multiple studies on running a river-based ferry in the downtown area, but this was their first actual foray into running a ferry service. What the JTA does offer patrons is operational consistency, something that was lacking in recent times. The ferry had been shuttling vehicles between Mayport Fishing Village and Fort George Island for over six decades. In 2016, about a quarter million vehicles made the nearly one-mile trip across the river. Without the ferry, commuters must rely on I-295 and cross the Dames Point Bridge, a 46-mile round trip taking nearly an hour. So the convenience of the ferry cannot be overstated. The route itself is considered an extension of State Road A1A. I spent many days on my bicycle riding this ferry so that I could enjoy riding up, up the coastline of Florida. It's great for biking, it's great for business owners, it's great for people that are enjoying our beaches and our coastline. Since 2007, when then-Governor Charlie Chris cut funding from the ferry from the state budget, its future had been tenuous. The Florida Department of Transportation gave up running the ferry shortly thereafter to the city of Jacksonville. The Jacksonville Port Authority operated the ferry for the city until 2012, until the city council enacted the St. John's River Ferry Commission to operate the ferry, which it did for three years, when in 2016, the JTA took over the operation. The role of the ferry is vital to uh, not only Mayport, the community of Mayport, but also the Navy base and shuttling people back and forth. Uh, it's a, a, a huge contributor to tourism, people that are coming up and down the A1A corridor. Since coming under the JTA Transit umbrella, the authority has invested more than $20 million into the ferry vessel and the entire infrastructure at both the ferry landings. The public has responded to all the improvements by taking more trips, a lot more trips. In fact, ridership has almost doubled compared to a few years ago. In the five years between 2008 and 2012, ridership averaged 21,000 per month. During the past five years under JTA, ridership is 39,250 per month. That's over a million more trips over the past five years. And while the numbers and convenience are certainly important, it's really hard to beat this view. In Mayport Village, Karen Adams, JTA Making Moves.
Up next, a special look at the artwork inside the new JRTC building and why it's so significant. Beginning in March, the U.S. Census Bureau will invite households across the country to participate in the 2020 Census. But what is the Census? Simply put, the Census is a headcount of every person living in the United States. To be sure the government represents the people, the U.S. Constitution requires a population count every 10 years. Ever since 1790, the Census has determined the number of seats each state receives in the U.S. House of Representatives. It is, and always has been, a cornerstone of our democracy. We still use it to determine representation, but leaders also use the data to make decisions. Your response helps guide planning for the future of our communities. The 2020 Census will help inform decisions on how billions of dollars are allocated annually for critical public services like roads, schools, hospitals and health care clinics, fire and emergency response services, and hundreds of other programs. In 2020, for the first time, you'll be able to complete the census online, by phone, or by mail. It asks a few simple questions, like how many people live in your home on April 1st, including their age and sex, and if there are any children living there. You should know that by law, all census responses are completely confidential, and your personal information cannot be shared with any law enforcement agencies. Every person counts, no matter who you are or where you live. So whether your family has participated for decades or the 2020 census will be your first, we all have a role in shaping the future of our country. Hey Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Do clouds take naps? I couldn't tell you. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Remember that to love America is to love all Americans. Because love has no labels. One in three adults has pre-diabetes. One in three. That means it could be you, your favorite brother, your other brother, you, yes. your football buddy, your football buddy, you, the boss, the boss's boss. If one in three adults has pre-diabetes, that means it could be you, your barber, your barber's barber. Nice work. Thanks. Thanks. You. Your plumber. Breathe right into your foot. Your plumber's masseuse. Yes. You, your dog walker. On your left. Your cat jogger. Or you, your co-pilot. Your co-pilot's co-pilot. While one in three adults has pre-diabetes with early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the risk test at doihaveprediabetes.org to know where you stand. Bring it. Home. Okay. Bye, guys. You guys need a ride? Sure. Oh, yeah. All right. How about some one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, I gotta go eat, man. Sorry. I'll, I'll see you later. Welcome back to Making Moves. Careful consideration was given to every little detail of the JRTC. The most obvious is the curved design and the unique blue glass front. Then there's the way the buses flow under the structure and around the concourse, 
so that the vehicles come to the passengers and not the other way around. The way the Skyway glides into the second floor of the building, dropping off passengers on an updated, more technologically advanced platform. But before we go, we wanted to talk a little about the inside of the JRTC. The attention to detail carries on to the inside as well, including what was going up on the walls. As Making Moves videographer Carlos Bouvier shows us, even with the artwork, it's about blending the old and historic with the new and the modern. When the Jacksonville Transportation Authority looked at how iconic the building would be, the JRTC would be, they also looked at the community in which the building was being constructed in. Knowing the importance of it, they wanted to make sure that it was a facility that was inclusive of people, of communities, of staff, and I think the inclusiveness is what has driven the success of a program of this magnitude. So we built a story, we built a comprehensive story around regional transportation and naturally what came out of that story was the La Villa community. So we did not want to forget about that story. We wanted it to make it relevant to the future and also to give other people an opportunity who just didn't understand that history to bring it into the facility in a artistic way, in a way that would be fun, in a way that would provide the staff and all of the visitors a good experience, a pleasant experience, but also to build awareness, education, give them whatever level of detail they wanted to comprehend. The staff, they love the color, they love the, the images, it has made the environment a fun place, it's added color, it's added texture, and they've been able to look at the history panels and gain a, a much better appreciation for the history of transportation, but how their roles, the work that they're doing now, will one day be part of the story and part of history, because they are the future of, of transportation in Jacksonville, in the region, in Northeast Florida. And that wraps up this edition of Making Moves. We hope you continue to take whatever precautions are necessary to keep you and your family safe during this medical crisis. Stay tuned to JTAFLA.com as well as our Facebook and Twitter pages for the latest updates on JTA services. For the entire Making Moves team, I'm Bill Milnes. Thanks for watching and stay safe, everyone. <music>